Thank you again for spending time with me, Darren. Pleasure. I'm wondering about a regenerative farm surrounded by farms that have depleting practices. How do they interact? It's a very interesting question for a lot of reasons. One of the biggest reasons why people don't um, change to more regenerative practice, you might say, is because it seemed it's, it's not normal. It's right on the fringes. And so if you happen to be that person who, which according to Charlie Massey um, and his work, or Dr. Charlie Massey now, um, and his work in his PhD around transitional, what he called transitional agriculture, is that I think it was 80 or 85% of people who changed from being conventional producers to let's say ecological producers or regenerative whatever you want to call it um, mostly had something wrong go in their life some like a bushfire an economic collapse uh, some a cancer in the family or something like that so something quite drastic had to go wrong in order for it wasn't largely an economic there wasn't a, it wasn't an economic trigger or anything like that. it was a, it was a push factor as opposed to a pull factor, you might say. So if you look at those who were um, going on the pull factor, those pull factor people and those push factor people, they're often, uh, well, they have to, they, they're often built of a fairly stoic stuff because the fact that they, like if they've been a traditional part of that community and been involved in the footy club or the netball club, you know, in the club life, which is in Australia in particular, um, or the, um, you know, the pub or whatever it is, the, you know, the, the, the kind of club life that we have in rural Australia in, at the least, then you're opening yourself up a bit and people are a bit, often a bit sensitive to that. That's, and that's one of the larger reasons that I can tell as to why um, people uh, are less likely to change because they don't want to be that person, right? Because there's two parts to that. One is that you put your head up on a, right? You, you put yourself on a pedestal, right? Um, and number two is that you're suggesting that what everyone else is doing is not right, right? And who wants to be that person, right? So there's some, so you, if you're going to do that, um, like if I want to go out into the Wimmera, which is, you know, not far from us here, hundred kilometers away, which is one of the biggest, um, and most successful cereal growing parts of Australia. I want to go out to there and I've been a fifth generation, sixth generation producer out there. And all of a sudden I'm going to go bring sheep back onto the property, start electric fencing them. Uh, start growing organically, doing mixed species cover crops, all of that stuff and bundle and do agroforestry, right? And do it organically. But one of the things about, which a lot of people in, who are perhaps new to agriculture or who are, well, just new to this game don't realise is that for all of its ills, conventional agriculture is extremely successful in producing and you know let's put park all of the inputs to one side for a moment and all of the externalities it's been extremely successful at um, being the base to a very reliable food system mm -hmm. so yeah we might put food in parenthesis but the fact is that there's a lot of food produced and there's a lot more humans that are eating food right so it's done and, and it's, you know, and in most cases, at least in Western agriculture, that's been done with all of the agents of all the biocidal agents um, that are on array and they've done a successful job with it. One of the things that I often come up against and it's a challenge is that because the system of agronomy and the system of food production now in conventional um, production is relatively reliable what it does is it cuts out all the variables mm -hmm. and that's something that a lot of people are quite who are conventional producers they are really afraid of bringing the variables back in right so the idea of simplifying everything and having a relatively prescriptive pres prescription based approach to food production while people might not like the idea of that it actually in a way works, right? 
Now, it doesn't work for your health, ultimately. It doesn't. I, I, I hope people just get what I'm saying here. You turn up to work as long as it rains, like if it's rain fed. Yeah. As long as it, it's more about does it rain at the right time? Um, because the actual, the growing of crops now is, is a really well organized science. Um, mm. Agronomists, like it's very precise, the volume of resources that they're using compared to what they did before. You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of efficiencies and that comes down to when you look at the gross efficiency is that if you go into the, into the areas with um, the highest crop value in Australia, which is the cotton growing areas, which are on the highest value land, the highest, pr most productive land, it has the least number of people. Like mm -hmm. the population density is appalling. Now, we shake our heads at that, but when you look at that from a pure economics perspective, that's nirvana because agricultural production is determined by the least, having the least amount of labor units and the least amount of capital applied. And so they are nailing that. These are complications in this narrative of trying to have people transition because as far as they're concerned, they've got it solved. I'm giving a, I'm giving a very generalist picture, but that's the picture. And so it's a, it's a difficult one. Um, and that's, that's like, you know, I go all over this, all over the world. So that's, I don't think that's much different really anywhere that I've worked at least. So we're probably not going to see the end of that kind of industrial agriculture. Well, oil's 30 bucks a barrel. I mean, you know, it's, that's what, that's what drives it. As long as the oil price is as low as it is, then where's the, where, where's the push factor? Well, what if you were able to replace one fossil fuels with something that's seen as renewable fuels, such as let's say you could have all solar instead of fossil, just, I know that seems a bit of well, a- the value, Well, the value chain, let's go to South Australia, right? So in South Australia, most of the, um, most of the electricity in South Australia is developed by renewables. So I would say that's had no influence on the decision-making of an agriculturalist to change their production method. Let's say that um, biofuels were able to be produced, say from canola or some other um, whatever source, let's say that those biofuels were able to be produced at the equivalent of $120 a barrel. It wouldn't make a difference to the production. So you'd need to have, there'd need to be a significant um, limit to, to current production capacity. I actually think that that's firstly going to come from phosphorus because the volume of, when you look at all of the peaks of everything, peak oil is, you know, well, let's not get into when that's going to happen because that's a, that's kind of like saying, when's the climate going to ultimately change so bad? Like I'm not going to get into that prediction business because people yeah. have been doing that for too long. Um, but yeah, you look at peak oil, what about peak phosphorus? So, um, or what about um, nitrogen? Um, because, you know, when you look at the major inputs of conventional agriculture, it's nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium and herbicides, um, which, and, and oil, which of those is going to, is going to break first? when it comes to the, um, to the limits, that, uh, to the resource limits. So is it nitrogen? Because um, there's gonna be more value use of liquid petroleum gas um, away from the Haber-Bosch process in other industries. So for, um, for energy generation or for whatever else. And so that drives up the price of LPG, which means then the price of nitrogen goes up. Is it going to be that we just run out of, um, or we're getting closer to the end of the um, uh, of the phosphate um, reserves that we have, which are largely, which are the largest reserves now are in the Western Sahara, Eastern Morocco, uh, sorry, yeah, Western Sahara, um, uh, Morocco, which is a, a disputed territory. So when that reserve is gone, just like Nauru is, was gone a long time ago and so on, these major reserves or the Chilean nitrate, which was gone a long time ago, when these reserves go, then what does that do to the whole picture of global agriculture? And, you know, well, you know, 
which will one of those be a push factor? In which case then um, people won't have a choice because if you turn off, you, like if you turn off phosphorus, right, or if you turn off nitrogen from these conventional sources, then you're going to have to look at the whole thing. It's not going to be a matter of, um, of being able to um, continue with the, with the current operating system. It will have to change and therefore invite the variables because the variables are biology, right? You have yeah. to bring biology back into it. And, you know, we've done, done this for a few hundred years now of eliminating biology from agriculture, apart from the core plants that we're growing and the core organisms that we're, that we're um, stewarding. What about if there were some um, limits imposed by community expectations, whether that goes through government or not, by saying you have no right to pollute the river, mm -hmm. or you should pay to clean up the pollution from those farms? Would that make a difference? Um, it's an interesting policy, uh, more at least. It, it, Look, in, in places like Australia, that would be a really hard sell um, uh, to, to, because there would have to be a different kind of mechanism. Um, what you're talking about is a mechanism by which uh, the, that we would start to charge agriculture um, for the externalities that it causes, right? Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to giving an opportunity to um, have an exchange for those externalities. In other words, um, actually pay for um, what's what I call payments for ecosystem services. Now that's been mooted by a number of bodies over the years, but who's going to pay it, you know? So, and it's usually this consumer um, who is, is the is the person or the um, is who's going to have to pay for those um, ecosystem services to be um, to be improved? Um, because if 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 it's left to the farmer, the farmer won't be able to do it, and they'll resist because they're already at the bottom, literally at the bottom of the food chain. As J. F. John F. Kennedy Senior said way back when he was president, um, farmers are the only people who who pay who pay wholesale, sell at wholesale, and pay the freight both ways, mm -hmm. right? So, then if you look at it in the context of, well, just seven years after JFK's untimely passing, um, uh, that the farm gate price uh, for 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 products in the United States was forty cents in the dollar of the retail dollar, it's now seven cents. So the terms of trade in agriculture globally, it's um, are terrible. Mm -hmm. um, like you're literally at the bottom of the food chain. And so any further impost on a farmer, however well-intentioned is just not gonna be uh, realized. It's going to have to be that we pay the farmer because that's ultimately their game again. Like if we came up to them and said, we're going to pay you $150 a hectare to, or let's say the equivalent of, or $200 a hectare to do these ecosystem processes, they go, well, that's actually a really good deal for me. I'll yeah. start. Yeah. So like, it's, like I said, it's either going to be push factors, which yeah. are going to be some sort of resource limit, or it's going to be a pull factor because there's something, an opportunity such, such as um, ecosystem services payments, mm -hmm. um, which are going to be um, forthcoming. So, you know, we had a few years ago when Julia Gillard was the prime minister in Australia, we had the uh, so-called carbon tax. Um, and that was at, pegged to being $23 a ton for two years, blah, 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 um, linked into carbon farming, et cetera. Now let's say that that actually got entrenched as an opportunity for say, it just, it, you know, where there was bipartisanship, it just became part of the market. Well, then farmers could go, okay, um, gee, if I could get three or four ton, uh, three or four tons of carbon sequestered, you know, even if I just put a block of trees in the corner, a block of trees in dry land sequesters about five tons per hectare. And if I was getting a hundred bucks 
a hectare, well, then I'd plant more trees on my shittier land because you know, you know what I mean? So when you've got the um, reliability of a market condition, which is going to, uh, you know, because a farmer is not going to go and take up the next, become a carbon farmer if there's policy and market fluctuations, which mean that they can't commit to that properly. Yeah. What about organic farming though? So some people are prepared to pay a higher price for a product if they know that it has some ecological certification. Well, the, mar the, margins, the margins in organic agriculture are, are, look, in some cases the prices are better, but the margins may not be. Right. Right. So it's not purely, and this is my point going back to Charlie, it's not purely a commercial decision because there's a lot of organic farmers who aren't necessarily doing better financially than their conventional neighbour. In a lot of cases, it's not inexpensive to be an organic farmer because the tools that you have to use, for example, if you're in cereals or vegetable production or that sort of thing, uh, annual crop production, well, then the tools that you have to use as an organic farmer are very different to what you have yeah. um, as a conventional farmer. And, you know, while you might get a 10% premium, you might it might cost you more to actually um, get to that point and where you are at the same margin or getting better. And that can take a number of years. Yeah, it's, it's a complex business anyway, um, this whole thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you.